Yet Christian mystics were something entirely different. Those who believe in the value of psychedelic drugs see no clear distinction. I believe that the experiences one, be, one has under LSD are very similar, even identical with mystical experiences. There has been a discussion along this with scientists, but if you compare the reports of mystics, of the saints, the text reports with uh, reports on people who had mystical experience under LSD, you cannot find any difference. Can the mystical experience of saints really be duplicated by chemical means? Thirty years after R.C. Zayner raised the question, his successors at the University of Oxford are still debating it. One of them is Richard Swinburne of Oriel College, who is Nolleth Professor of the Philosophy of the Christian Religion. Taking drugs to get into the presence of God is barging into the presence of God. And if you just go and have an experience, this is, you're simply not equipped to recognize the experience for what it is and to react to it in the right way. So, uh, for that reason, no, I wouldn't take drugs. There's so much more to religion, indeed almost everything more to religion than having experience. It's a dedication to a way of life which indeed can be very much reinforced by experience, but experience isn't the point of it. Spiritual self-transcendence was hardly the ambition of another group interested in LSD and mescaline during the 1950s. The American government were attracted to hallucinogenic drugs for less savoury purposes. Former intelligence officer and author John Marx has uncovered the CIA's secret research with LSD. In the early 1950s, the CIA and American military intelligence were funding the lion's share of the, of the research on LSD. You can give the intelligence agencies an awful lot of credit for uh, starting a field of uh, experimentation into these sorts of drugs. Through the Freedom of Information Act, Marx has obtained copies of classified CIA documents that reveal why the agency was interested in LSD. The essence of the intelligence business is control. This was a, 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 an instrument or a potential instrument for breaching people's control, for making them commit acts against their will. In 1963, the CIA produced an internal report so sensitive only one copy was made. It concerned MK Ultra, a project that involved the testing of LSD on unwitting American citizens throughout the 1950s. They wanted to know how a diplomat might react if given LSD at a party, how a foreign leader might react if given LSD just before he was to get up and give a speech, how it might be used in interrogation of prisoners or something of that sort. Uh, given the fact that the CIA felt it had to do that kind of testing, they had to find uh, unwitting test participants participants who by definition couldn't be told they were being given the drug and so what the CIA did is it looked for people who were let's say on whose lives they put less value than on the life of an American scientist or a businessman or someone of that sort the CIA turned to people like uh, drug addicts prostitutes prisoners uh, inmates and in mental hospitals um, and used them as test subjects People who did not know what happened, they believed they became insane, and they, uh, all kinds of accidents happened uh, following these kind of ingestions. That was really a crime. To give people uh, without their knowledge with agents is a crime. The American military were also experimenting with LSD as a potential weapon. Here is a group of normal soldiers responding correctly to a series of routine drill commands. After receiving a small dose of LSD, they're confused and undisciplined. The idea was to spray the drug on enemy troops. The dose, however, proved rather difficult to control. 
And there was a different kind of fallout from these experiments, one that took the army and the CIA entirely by surprise. Civilians exposed to LSD began to do strange things. I believe with uh, the advent of acid, we discovered a new way to think. And it had to do with piecing together new thoughts in your mind that produced people like uh, Bob Dylan and John Lennon and William S. Burroughs that were using new images together in a way that uh, jarred the mind and, and produced images that uh, were latent in our consciousness, but were not being brought about by reading uh, Vanity Fair or Woman's Home Companion. In 1960, CIA-funded researchers at the Menlo Park Hospital in California were paying students $40 a day to take LSD. One volunteer was Ken Kesey, psychedelic folk hero, author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and today a farmer in Oregon. You were in a little room pretty much by yourself. There was a window with uh, wire grating on it, and through that window you could look out and see a lot of people out there who understood a whole lot more what you were going through than these doctors. And my metaphor for the thing was, it's as though these people had discovered a room and they thought there was something in that room of value to them, but they didn't want to go in there. So they hired students to go in there and after a number of those students came out with a wild look in their eye, they said, close up that room and don't let anybody else go back in that room. And that's when I found that my key fit the doctor's office and decided that this was too important a business to leave in the hands of the government. Awed by the power of the drug, Kesey began to distribute it to his friends. Across America, LSD was leaking out of the laboratory. I've always thought that this is one of those things that proves that God has a sense of humor. That if Gabriel come up and says, hey, uh, chief, the uh, Americans are really messed up down there. We're going to have to do something to straighten them out. They've got a nosedive karma going on. And God says, well, send them some of that stuff you've been working on, that uh, acid stuff, uh, and have the CIA distribute it you can hear the celestial laughter when, when you realize it was the CIA that really turned on America. <laughs> In the early 1960s, 20 years after Albert Hoffman bicycled unsteadily home from the laboratory, his discovery was poised to kindle a revolution among the young of the West. For the father of LSD, it was an alarming prospect. I knew from the use of this kind of substances in old cultures by the Indians, there is a taboo on these substances. They are only used in uh, the legions uh, setting and um, are in the hands of the shaman, not in the public. And the shaman in our, pub uh, in our society is a psychiatrist and it should remain in the hands of, of the shaman. And therefore, I was really became immediately I become skeptical and anxious that bad things would could happen, and it happened indeed by the unwise and uncontrolled uh, uh, use of this substance. Next week, in the second of these two programs, every man follows the bizarre and sometimes tragic events as LSD exploded onto an unsuspecting world.